Good afternoon, everybody. Let me proceed to the paper. This is an overview of the presentation, and I'll go straight to the objective of the paper. First, let me start with the background. In January 2012, former Governor Mandanas filed a petition at the Supreme Court seeking to compel the national government to um, include internal revenue taxes collected by the Bureau of Customs that excise and documentaries taxes in the computation of the ag aggregate share of LGUs in national internal revenue taxes as provided in the local government code. They, uh, Mandanas also questioned the deduction of certain items from the IRA share. In August 2013, the late uh, Representative Garcia filed the petition at the SE also seeking to compel the national government to compute IRA on the basis of all taxes, not only internal revenue taxes. Both petitioners plead for the prospective application of the SC ruling should the uh, SC agree with them that the present manner of computing the IRA does not give LGUs a just share in national taxes. In July 2018, and which is affirmed in an April 2019 decision, the SC ruled that aggregate IRA should be computed as 40% of all taxes not just internal revenue taxes, and that the deductions from the era being questioned by Mandanas are valid. The application is not, I'm sorry, this is a typo, the application of increasing the IRA is not prospective, or rather is prospective, this is correct. The application of the ruling is prospective on the basis of the post of operative doctrine. Thus, the increase in the IRA arising from this ruling will start in 2022. In December 2019, the DBCC estimates the 20, April 2019 SC ruling on the Mandanas Garcia petitions will result in an increase in the aggregate IRA in 2022 from 847.4 if the old manner of computing the era were followed to 1.1 uh, trillion or an increment of 225 billion or point point uh, or roughly one percent of gdp now the objectives of the study the study aims to find answer the following question first what are the options available to government that will allow it to allocate uh, 1.1 trillion for the era in FY2022 while keeping within the bounds of its medium term fiscal program. That is while ensuring fiscal sustainability. The second question it tries to answer is what is the impact, if any, of the manner by which the increase in the era resulting from the SC ruling uh, on what is the impact of the increase in the era on vertical and horizontal fiscal balance across the different levels of LGUs and across LGUs within each level. Third, how does one minimize the fiscal disparities across LGUs so as to provide all LGUs the ability to provide comparable level of public services at comparable rates of taxation? And for what policy instruments are available to government to ensure that national objectives are met, given that an increasing proportion of total general government spending will be made by LGUs with significant funding coming from the ERA, which is a block grant. In terms of fiscal sustainability, there are really three options. The first one is to increase tax rates or impose new taxes so as to generate additional revenue equal to roughly 1% of GDP in 2022, plus an additional 0.35 of GDP in 2025, and an additional 0.14% of GDP in 2028, etc. Over and above the incremental revenues from tax reform, which were intended to fund build, build, build. This will not 
be easy may not even be feasible, given that the increase in tax effort from the train one was just equal to 0.5% of GDP yearly in 2018 and 2019. In fact, now with the COVID uh, uh, impacting negatively on the economy, in tax revenues are down. This table simply gives you the trend in the tax effort, both from the BIR and the BOC. The other option to ensure fiscal, to finance the increase in the IRA is to increase the fiscal deficit by 0.9% of GDP yearly. Increasing fiscal deficit likely to be fiscally sustainable in the short term, given that the country's NG debt to GDP ratio is lower than the international benchmark. But implementing a more expansionary fiscal stance long term may be risky from a fiscal sustainability in, uh, perspective. Note that increase, the increase in the era is really not a one-off. It will continue prospectively from 2022 onwards. The third op option is to unfund some programs, activities, and projects that are now funded under the General Appropriations Act to create fiscal space for the increase in the era. This means that the national government will have 225.3 billion pesos less budgetary resources with which to fund public services that it has been providing the public prior to the said SC decision. The question then is, how can the national government ensure no corresponding reduction in the delivery of public services, even as its spending on its own account is reduced. And here we argue that this can be done by selecting programs that will be unfunded, such that you choose programs that are currently being funded under the budgets of some national government agency from the GAA, but which represent functions that are assigned to LGUs under the 1991 local government code. Uh, the DBM has called such a move real devolution. Take note that um, for the longest time, even if some services have already been devo devolved, the national government, at least some certain national government agencies, continue to include in their budgets uh, programs, activities, and projects for devolved functions. So now, given that the it, given that option three appears to be the more realistic option for fiscal sustainability, we then ask ourselves: How do we choose programs, activities, and projects that are now funded under the budgets of some NGAs in the GAA that may be unfunded? First. We argue that you identify the POPs in the NGA budgets that are included in the list of functions that are assigned to LGUs under the Section 17 of the LGC. In other words, we want to we will look at the GAA, try to identify programs, activities, and projects that are actually devolved function as per the local government code. Uh, he, this table is simply just a summary of the functions that are assigned to local governments under the local government codes, covering agricultural extension, natural resource management, environmental services, health services, local infrastructure services, social welfare, housing, DRR, solid waste management, and others. Take note that the functions in the table I've shown below are, are above are for the most part high level functions, meaning they're expressed in very broad terms. Health, uh, section 17 of the local government code, for instance, appear to say that all of her health services should be 
the responsibility of local government units. However, if you look at health, one may argue that not all health services are appropriately assigned to LGUs when, when health is considered in its entirety based on principles of expenditure assignment. So there is a need to unbundle or deconstruct these broadly defined functions. So the second step in identifying the PAPs that will be unfunded from the GAA is to narrow down the initial list of PAPs that we identify as per uh, in the step above, taking into account the following principles of expenditure assignment. First, that function and competencies whose benefits are local in scope should be assigned to local governments. Provision of public goods and services that either involve economies of scale are best assigned to higher level governments. Functions that involve significant externalities, that means, in other words, functions whose benefits spill over outside of local jurisdiction should be assigned to higher level of governments. And finally, that functions related to the redistributive role of government are best assigned to the central government. Following those principles, in this table we have identified, we have tried to unbundle the different PAPs in the budgets of various departments uh, and identify the more specific PAPs, not all, that are are truly appropriate to be devolved to LGUs. For instance, from DA, irrigation network services to small irrigation services, also agricultural machinery, DA farm to market roads, from the DOH budget, human resources for LGUs. For instance, doctors to the barrios, uh, nurses, the RN Hills, the nurses, the hiring of nurses to be deployed to local governments, social health protection assistance or as health assistance to indigent patients, etc. Supplementary feeding from the DSWD, services for residential and service uh, center-based clients from the DSWD, uh, from the DPWH, construction rehabilitation of various in infrastructure projects, including local infrastructure projects. Of course, the, low, the LGSF, the Local Government Support Fund, the M MDA Solid Waste Management Program, uh, Barangay Officials Debt Benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So far, we have identified a total of 247 billion pesos from the 2020 GAA that may be unfunded. The biggest contribu contributor to this amount is uh, the DPWH, uh, which accounts, which has 164 billion pesos included in its budget for various local infrastructure. Next is the LGSF, the Local Government Support Fund, and the DOH. The question that if, if you look at these numbers here in this uh, slide, you will note that the amount of appropriated for the PAPs we have identified is bigger than the projected increase in the era by roughly 22 billion pesos. The question then that begs to be asked is should the national government reallocate to other national government functions, these 22 billion pesos that is in, the, in excess of the amount required to fund the increase in the IRA. The short answer is no, because additional financing is needed to address vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalance issues. And that's going ahead of my story here. So now let me go into issues related to vertical and horizontal fiscal imbalance. 
vertical fiscal imbalance across different levels of LGUs is evident if one uh, scrutinizes the data. In particular, if one assumes that the national government is not only omniscient, meaning all-knowing, but also benevolent, in the sense that its budget allocation decisions are aimed at maximizing the welfare of its citizens, at least in the aggregate, then the implication is that it is important to ensure that LGUs continue to provide the services associated with identified EAPs in the previous table that I have shown. For this to happen, the following conditions will have to be met. First, the increase in the IRA of all LGUs in the aggregate should be enough for them to deliver the same level of services that were made available to local constituents prior to the effectivity of the SC era ruling. And second, the second condition is that LGU should prioritize the services associated with the unfunded PATs. Given this background, if we are to verify the first condition, uh, what we did is to assign, at least notionally, the 2020 GAA appropriations for the, un for the proposed unfunded dead PATs to provinces, cities, and municipalities in a manner that is consistent with Section 17 of the Local Government Code. For instance, if the code says uh, farm-to-market roads from the DA budget, who will be, or rather, let me put it this way. For instance, if we look at the budget for farm to market roads in the Department of Agriculture budgets, that amount we assigned notionally to municipalities because municipalities are for the most part in charge of barangay to market road, of farm to market roads. One can also argue that perhaps we can um, assign that two barangays, but at this point in time, that's kind of risky knowing that uh, barangays do not really have the capability to do much infrastructure investment. So after doing that, we then compare the aggregate amounts assigned to each level of LGU with the increase in the era of each level to provide evidence of whether there is vertical fiscal balance across the different levels of LGU. The results are found in this table. So what we see here is that the notional share of provinces, cities, and municipalities and barangays in red devolved spending of NG amounting to 225 billion uh, the share of provinces is close to 38%, while that of cities is 20% and municipalities 22.6%. Now con con compare these shares with what the LGUs will receive uh, uh, across different levels of LG as per the era distribution formula. So as per the era distribution formula in the 1991 code, provinces will receive 23%, which is less than what they should be delivering as uh, if, uh, if the spending were to be the same uh, from the PAPs. So in short, what we found out to summarize is that there is a vertical imbalance problem across different levels of LGU as indicated by the net incremental era transfer being negative for provinces and cities, more severe for the former compared to the latter and net 
ERA transfer being positive for municipalities and barangays, larger for barangays compared to the municipalities. Take note that this result, the vertical in fiscal imbalance result, is also found in earlier years, in particular, uh, uh, an earlier, much, much earlier study in 2005 found out that the, the net resource transfer uh, is negative for provinces and municipalities and positive for cities from 1995 to 1999. Prospectively, there is a need for a more comprehensive evaluation of the vertical fiscal imbalance, taking into account not just the incremental uh, functions that, has, that will be redevolved given the funding source for the increase in the IRA, but the totality of all functions assigned to LGUs. At the same time, the study looks at evidence of horizontal fiscal imbalance across individual LGUs. And to do this, what the study did is to uh, check whether each LGU, each province, its city, its municipality, will have an incremental era that will allow each one of them to provide comparable uh, level of services related to the PAPs that are proposed to be redevolved to them. And what is done here is to allocate notionally the increase in the, the PAP funding to individual LGUs within each level on the basis of some objective measure of need. We did not try to replicate, it should be emphasized, that the study did not try to replicate how NGAs allocate their spending on PAPs to the regional and sub-regional level. We do know, um, for instance, that it's very difficult to, in this case, assume that the allocation of resources to individual LGUs or even regions is in fact um, uh, appropriate or efficient given the very political nature of uh, the funding for most of these PAPs, in particular uh, the funding for various local infrastructure embedded in the DPWH budget, for instance which we know is really for all intents and purposes pork barrel that is determined uh, during budget preparation just to work around the PDAF ruling of the Supreme Court in a much earlier decision. So having doing this, after doing this exercise, here this table shows the basis for distributing the amounts that will be unfunded for the different functions from the different of the different departments to individual provinces cities municipalities and barangays on the basis of what we call objective um ob objective evidence of needs at the lgu level The final result of this subset of the exercise for this study is to show, or rather shows, that 66 out of 81 percent, uh, 66 of 80 out of 81 provinces, or 82 percent of provinces, have negative net resource transfer. 43 out of 145 cities will or 30% of them will have net resource transfers and 10% or close to 11% of municipalities will have net resource, negative net resource transfers. Again, this echoes findings in earlier studies 
but for the entirety of the era. Just to show you some flavor, uh, granular uh, flavor to these findings, these are the top 10 provinces as well as the bottom 10 provinces in terms of net per capita resource transfer. Batanes, as usual, gets uh, about 4,600 pesos per capita in terms of net resource transfer, meaning increase in era, less increase in the funding they need. Um, the smaller provinces in particular have positive net resource transfer, Batanes, Binagat, Biliran. The, the major losers here we see Oriental Mindoro, Ilocos Norte, Apayao, quite a bit of uh, car provinces here. These are the winners and losers among municipalities and the winners and losers among cities. Now, if the horizontal fiscal imbalance is to be addressed, we need equalization grants, i.e. grants that will attempt to, over and above the era, grants that will try to address the disparity in the fiscal capacity or the increase in the era relative to their needs. To conclude, the, we go back to the first question or one of the first questions we ask, should the national government uh, reallocate to other national government functions the 22 billion that is in excess of the amount required to fund the increase in the era? The answer is no, we use this amount to implement first an equalization grant and the second is an engine ng counterpart in conditional matching grant or cost sharing arrangement that will incentivize LGUs to spend in a manner that is consistent with national priorities or objectives. In addition to NG cost sharing mechanism, other mechanisms that will encourage LGUs to prioritize spending on national objectives and or merit goods include creating local demand for devolved services, I mean, first of which in, would relate to raising public awareness on functional assignment of NG versus LGUs. For the longest time, when something goes wrong in terms of service delivery at the LGU level, the public local constituents would very seldom blame local governments. Instead, they blame the national government. There's traffic in Manila. We blame, uh, we don't really blame the local governments in Manila. Rather, we say, President Digong, uh, please address the traffic problem in Metro Manila. Garbage is not collected in our barangays most of the time. We complain, but not to the LGU, not to the municipality or the city. At the same time, so that's raising public awareness. We should educate the citizens to demand the right, the public services that are devolved services from their local governments. And the other uh, mechanism is improving citizen CSO participation in local planning and budgeting. I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.